Well, good afternoon, um, and thanks for being here today uh, in person, and those of you who are here with us virtually and digitally as well. Uh, I'm Cliff May. I'm the founder and president of the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, FDD, and I'm pleased to welcome you for this conversation, Protests, Crackdowns, and the Future of Hong Kong. With the ongoing protests taking place in the streets of Hong Kong, we're glad to have Jimmy Lai here with us to share what he is seeing on the ground and to discuss a range of other issues. Uh, today's program is one of the first public events FDD is hosting on the Indo-Pacific. Uh, several of my colleagues, including John Shanzer, who will moderate today's discussion, uh, just returned from an informative trip to Asia. All of us at FDD are seeing the rising threat to free and democratic societies from the ruling Communist Party of China. We see this as a space that deserves more attention and one which we are ramping up. For more information on our work and to sign up for the latest analyses from FDD, we encourage you to visit our website, fdd.org. It should be very clear there how you do that. Hope so, if not, let us know. We're glad to be joined today by a distinguished audience of diplomats, representatives from the executive branch, uh, many experts from the policy community, and several domestic and international media outlets. Many of our audience members already know that FDD is a nonpartisan policy institute we're a source for timely research, analysis, and policy options to Congress, the administration, the media, and the wider national security community. We accept no foreign government or foreign corporate funding. In addition to the folks joining us here today, I'd like to welcome those tuning in over the live stream. We invite all of you to join in on the conversation, which will be live tweeting, and that'll be at FDD. At this time, I'd ask that you please silence your cell phones, and I'm pleased to turn the mic over to our moderator for the day, John Shanzer, who is FDD's Senior Vice President for Research. John, Jimmy, thank you. Thank you very much, Cliff, uh, and for uh, uh, Jimmy Lai for being thank here you. today. Uh, I'm going to just give a quick introduction to, uh, to Mr. Lai. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with him, uh, he's the chairman of Next Digital, the largest publicly traded media company in Hong Kong. His flagship publication, Apple Daily, which he founded in 1995, is the most widely read paper in Hong Kong and Taiwan today. Mr. Lai was educated at the fifth grade level and immigrated from Shanghai to Hong Kong at the no, age of... Uh, Kentong. What's that? Not Shanghai. Kentong. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. Stand corrected. Um, uh, uh, he immigrated to Hong Kong at the age of 13, where he first worked in a garment factory for $8 a month. Yeah. Do I have that correct? Uh, today, he is the only Hong Kong business tycoon, uh, tycoon who is not pro-Beijing. Uh, he is an outspoken advocate of democracy for China, and in particular for the rights of abused Christians. He has been a strong supporter of Hong Kong's pan-Democrats. So welcome. Uh, what I thought we would do today is to have uh, a conversation, just the two yep. of us, for a few minutes, and then what we'll do is we'll open up uh, the floor to questions from the audience as well. Uh, but first, maybe we'll just start with, if we can go back in time right. to the handover right. in 1997. Right. Uh, that was obviously, that's a big moment uh, for us to be looking back on. Right. What, did you see signs early on? What's the evolution? of China's encroachment onto Hong Kong. Obviously, you were supposed to have two systems, one country. Right. Um, was that actually a practice, or was that lip service? And, and, and why is it that we've gotten to this point of tension? Uh, I think initially, it was, uh, it was a very good intention of the Chinese. They integrate very little, to be honest, up until they see that we had the guts to resist them. Like um, in, 19, uh, in 2014, they introduced the, 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 20, you know, the Bill 23, which is you know, tightening the control of Hong Kong's freedom. We had over half a million people went out and demonstrate, and they withdrew the bill. After they withdrew the bill, they concentrate very hard on supporting those pro-establishment legislators and got a lot of more vote and kicked out some of the pan-democrats. So you can see that every movement 
that they back off, they actually come back and squeeze harder and narrow our limit, you know, narrow our limited uh, freedom. So then that came the um, Umbrella Movement. After the Umbrella, we failed. We got nothing from it after 79 days sitting on the street. After that, they squeezed further, eroding further the Hong Kong's freedom, like disqualify some of the legislator and put some young politician in prison and banning some of the journalists coming to Hong Kong or you know cancel the visa. All that, you know, it's just every time you resist them, this is come back with more control squeezing tighter and eroding the rule of law and, and the freedom we have. Mm. So it sounds like they're, they're clearly hijacking uh, the system uh, in Hong Kong, the idea yes. of, of squeezing out the people that, that don't view the world the way that they do, right, right, don't have right. the same objectives. Yep. Uh, I mean, how, how have they done that, and, and what are the kinds of people that they've been installing uh, that have tried to promote the Beijing agenda? Because we, we don't have the real democracy. We have a very limited, you know, a legislator, you know, uh, uh, voted by the public. So they have actually, you know, they have control of the legislative council almost. You know, half are nominated, another half is, uh, is, is election, elected because it's elected. They, they get very, a, a lot more resources than the Pan Democrats, so you know they got a lot of votes too. Um, yeah, they control it. They control it. So now this time, the re the recent uh, resistance movement, as you know, is caused by the extradition law amendment, which is a very vicious conspiracy of undermining Hong Kong's rule of law and human right and the freedom. Um, so we use even you know we even we were aware of the erosion of our freedom. We also we still took the freedom we had, the rule of law he had, for granted, hmm. until it's threatened this time by the extradition law amendment. So everybody was very angry. They stood up. You know, we resist, you know, we have two million people went out. And then what is amazing this time that changes everything is that the young people has taken, has taken up the torch to be leading the movement. Mm. You know, if I could just ask you, just to clarify, the extradition law, there, we're, we're not concerned about, this is not about uh, murderers who find their way to Hong Kong, right? No. I mean, this is, this is deliberately designed in, in the eyes of the Hong Kong residents to, uh, to basically send opponents of the regime in Beijing back to the mainland. Yes. Right? This is about yes. neutralization of the opponents of the Beijing exactly. regime. Because if the, if the Chinese communists can, can nap anybody, arrest anybody into their jail, Hong Kong's rule of is totally finished. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Now, you've, you've been obviously a, a proponent for uh, the independence of Hong Kong. Um, not independent. Or not independence, no, not political no. I, independence. I was, I, was, uh, <laughs> I support separate the system. democratization of Hong Kong. To have no. a separate system. Yeah. Um, now, there are, the, there are those who would say, well, look, uh, China is uh, moving in the right direction. They are, uh, they're becoming more capitalist with Chinese characteristics, uh, right? Uh, this is the sort of thing that we, we hear is that, well, what, what's, what's the problem? I mean, tell, in essence, what's the concern that you have about the regime in Beijing? What, what, what do they want and what do you not want them to do in Hong Kong? Well, people's conception about China becoming, the richer they become, the more liberal they become, which has turned out to be untrue. You know, they have actually becoming more, you know, more barricades 
you know, around the, you know, to, to, to the labor, to, to, to the labor countries and, uh, and squeezing, you know, squeezing people's liberty, you know, their, their control today in China is unprecedented. There was never a dictator had such a total control of the people like what C has, because nobody had the electronic devices to know where you are, to recognize you where you know where you go. You know, if you want to, if you you say something wrong, you immediately find out that you can't buy a trade ticket, you can't buy an air air ticket. You are not allowed in a lot of places. You are not allowed to open a, a bank account, and. If you were a, a, a criminal, you go to the theater in the entrance, they recognize your face and mm. come and arrest you. So this kind of control, no dictator ever had in the past. So that would be a great challenge for C when you have an innovation of this total control on people mm. that nobody had. It's very dangerous. Mm. Because you have, you have not built the ability to manage that. Mm -hmm. You have not built the ability to guard against people's revolt. You know, because history is trial and error. You can't all of a sudden create something and think that that will, because you can have control that people will subservient to it. So I think this is one of the danger C has created for himself. Mm. Now, this is interesting to me because, so you talk about the system that she is trying to uh, implement, not only in the mainland, but potentially in, in Hong Kong and, and elsewhere. This would seem to undercut his own interests. Right? Hong Kong's independence, uh, political independence, or the, the, the separate system that it has, uh, is, a, is a money generator at the end of the day. This is a, uh, th this is a capital of finance uh, that thrives on free yeah. market. Yeah. So. Was this an overreach uh, on his part? Is it actually, does it actually benefit him now that the people have come out and pushed back? Well, one thing you have to understand of the communists, they're materialists. They only understand things when it hits them. They don't have idea about moral, about people's, you know, feeling, all that, you know, they just, just hardcore materials that you know only things counts only when it moves. Mm. So when they first introduced the you know extradition law, I'm sure they did not expect that the money is freeing. You know, business people are moving out. That people are perceiving. The rule of law is being undermined, so the foundation of a financial center status is being eroded. Mm -hmm. Because you know, if you don't have rule of law, mm -hmm. you can't have a financial center. Right. Because where 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 comes the the, the, the protection? Where comes the the tr the mutual trust in the financial institution? Because trust is a very important institution in the financial world. Otherwise, you know, money will not move so fast. So they did not, they did not understand it until things happen. But even if Hong Kong just slip away, mm. if Hong Kong people make so much trouble for them politically, they would rather have Hong Kong totally undermined and change hmm. because we used to be 25% of the economy. Now we are only two and a half. Hmm. If the trouble is not worth for the two and a half percent of the economy to hell with it, mm -hmm. why hmm. should they care? Important point. Um, you wrote a, a, a fascinating piece in the New York Times not too long ago and your argument was not actually one about finance, it wasn't about money. Uh, or, or what the value of Hong Kong was to the Chinese or how to push back in, in those ways. Uh, but rather, you talked about um, uh, moral force. Mm -hmm. 
Can you maybe just explain a little bit about what that idea means to you? Well, I think for Hong Kong people's resistance, the fight against tyranny is a war of moral force. What do we have except moral force? We don't have guns, we don't have money, we don't have nothing. The only thing we have, we can win and we can attack the vulnerability of the communists is the lack of moral authority. That's the only way we can persist to resist them. And that's, I think, what the America, the, uh, you know, America has really forgotten how important a weapon they have in their hand, which the moral authority. A lot of people are saying that, okay, we have a, we have a trade deal now with China. Let's not offend them. Let's do it afterwards. This is totally wrong and stupid. You know, if the Chinese wants to talk about trade deal, the moral authority of America is a very strong and big deal chips on the table. This is what they don't have. Mm -hmm. That's what a big chip that you have in the negotiation against them. Mm -hmm. If they don't want to talk, nothing matters. If they want to talk, this is what you have that they don't have that you have to use. Because you have to always know that. You have to deal with the communists with strength, not weaknesses. And China needs the world and America more than the world and America need them. Otherwise, they won't talk to you. Mm -hmm. Why should they talk to you? Mm. So, so uh, you know, I, I, I think, I think it's, it's about time that America especially the government, we think about the very powerful weapon they have in, in their hand, which mm. is the moral authority they have. Mm. You know, I, I'm, I'm sure you know, the, the administration understands now. Mm. Well, there are a lot of people who would be critical of this administration and perhaps previous administrations uh, of being a bit too transactional, not promoting democracy, not yeah. supporting democracy, mm -hmm. and I think mm -hmm. When we look at uh, especially what's happening in, in Hong Kong right now, I think it's potentially a missed opportunity. But you have actually had an opportunity uh, over the last couple of days to meet with the Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo. Right. You've yes, met with uh, Vice President Mike Pence. Yes. Uh, yes you've met did. with a number of uh, sen senior senators as well. Yeah, I'm meeting uh, them now. Meeting them yeah. today. Um, what what are what are these conversations? I mean, what what happens in these conversations? Are you getting a sense that America is is ready to commit to supporting Hong Kong? Is this a um, a work in progress? Well, I think they all agree that. So you know, you, Hong Kong is fighting a war of the same values as you. It means that we are fighting your war in the in your enemy camp. We need your support. Without your support, we won't have the very vivo, morally, and materially to really persist this resistance. You know, your support is, 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 is very important. That's why I asked yeah, um, Mr. Pompeo and Vice President, I said, look, say something to encourage the Hong Kong people, especially young people. You know, it's like when Canada, when Kennedy went to, went to Berlin, he said that I'm a Beriner. How much confidence and hope he gave to the Beriner to face the threat of Soviet Union at that time. We need the same thing. We need the support, we need the confidence, we need the hope, we need, we need to know that America is behind us. Mm. And by backing us, the America also showing to the world of their moral authority. Because we are the only place in China, a tiny island in China, which is sharing your values which is fighting the same war you have with, chi with, with China. If we think that we are starting a cold war with China today, 
A Cold War is a war of competing values. Mm. And we are on your side, sacrificing our life, our freedom, everything we have, fighting this war in the frontier for you. Should, we, should you support us? This is something that America has to know. Not only supporting us, but use your moral authority in this Cold War to win this war well, we, in the beginning. Yeah. Because they have nothing. We, it's we, like they are like, go, they, they are like going to the, to the battle without any weapon. Hmm. And you have the nuclear weapon. You can finish them in a minute. We, uh, we hear a lot about the shift to great power conflict here in this town right now, that we are moving away from wars in the Middle East, and we now need to face challenges coming from uh, Russia to a lesser extent, China to a greater extent. Um, is the moral support that you're talking about, is that enough? Uh, are there things that America can do beyond just saying that we support you? Um, I mean, for example, I mean, we were just in Taiwan recently, and the Taiwanese were watching very intently as protests were erupting uh, in, in Hong Kong. In Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And they were saying that this could be the beginning of a counter movement. I mean, if we can broaden out a little bit to uh, the, the rest of Asia, I mean, what, what should the U.S. be thinking about here? I think, you know, of course, you know, the U.S. cannot just say it. You, you, know, you have to show your sincerity, your support with actions. Not like if you send some senators or congressmen to Hong Kong and just to be there to offer your support physically to the Hong Kong people, you know how much impact you can make, how much more you know, force you can reinforce in our heart, in our mind to refight this war. You know, this is something I think that, you know, that America has to, has to know about it, not just, not just say it. Um, just a, maybe a, a, a slight diversion. You became a Catholic in, in 1997. You've been an outspoken advocate for the rights of abused Christians in China. Can you talk just a little bit about that as well? Um, well, I, I, yeah, I, I'm in a very devout family. You know, I became Catholic just because the influence of the family. And also, uh, at that time, I did not think about it very clearly, but instinctively, I think that I need the strength of a faith. Because everybody was telling me that you will, if they, they arrest 10 people, you will be one of them. So if I'm in prison, and have a faith. Maybe, maybe I can I can sustain for longer. But anyway, that was not I was thinking about, you know. But I think you know, I naturally became a, a Catholic, and uh, I think the faith gave me a lot more sense of the righteousness to fight. You know, I don't have to worry about it if I really have a God that I believe a faith that I can put my whole life to, all I have to do is just to do the right thing. You know, so I, I will overcome my fear because the communists, what they use most effectively is impose fear in you. You know, like somebody asked me whether you think the resistance now is going on will eventually end up like Tiananmen massacre 30 years ago. Um, is it possible? I said yes, it's possible for a few reasons. First, because the communists they only know about force, nothing else. And the principle of rule is control, control, control. If they find out that they cannot control us, they will have to use force 
to a point that they use in Tiananmen massacre. And they can justify this. Because now they look at the Hong Kong people, at least a large part of it, as deportables. Somebody they don't need. Some, all of these people, the trouble these people make, they don't, they don't want. But they can't suppress us. The more they suppress, the more we bounce back. Mm. So the way that they look at us as the heater was looking at the Jews. Mm. Let's get rid of them. They can't guess us, but they can, they can impose so much fear that we feel totally hopeless and migrate if they create a massacre like Tiananmen. All these people will give up. So desperate, you know, they will migrate. And they, they will get rid of all these deplorables. Who we are to the Chinese government, we're just 0.5% of the population, 0.5%. Mm. This is the percentage they look at us, not human. They look at us, 0.5%. This is what Hong Kong is. Mm. They can get rid of this 0.5% and have peace. Mm. They can replace the Hong Kong people many times more mm. in Hong Kong. Mm. So this can happen. Mm. So I, I do want to get to Q&A, but I want to ask you one final question. So you've painted a p potentially bleak picture of a possible Tiananmen type of uh, situation further down the line. Right. For right now, the Hong Kong people seem to have walked away with a sort of a victory. The chief executive seems to have uh, killed the bill um, the, and uh, the extradition bill. And, and so it, it looks as if uh, Hong Kong has emerged victorious, at least in this round. There's no permanent victory here. It does seem like it's a permanent battle. So what, if, if you were to guess, what is China's next move? What is Beijing's next move on Hong Kong? I don't believe this is a victory. I don't believe it's even a small victory. Because after this extradition law amendment, we know that we will always be facing the same vicious conspiracy, the vicious government we just faced without democracy, without universal suffrage. Even if we win this, you know, they totally withdraw it. Kelly Lam, the chief executive, is going to, you know, step down and a few of, of these high officials step down. But the boss is still there. We are still always under the duress of this region, uh, uh, regime. If we don't have the universal suffrage, we will always face the same devil we face. Mm. This, unless we have universal, universal suffrage, there's no victory. Understood. Well, thank you very much for, for these comments here. I do want to open it up to the floor. So if you have a question, just please raise your hand. We have some microphones that will be circulating. So uh, as soon as you, uh, you raise your hand, we'll get one to you. But why don't we start here with General Jack Keane in the front row. Thanks, Jimmy, for your Thank comments. You. Really appreciate it. And, and the, the moral force that you represent is, is very admirable. Thank you. Um, two million people out of seven million. In the United States, that would mean over 85 million people protesting. Right. That's amazing. Um, what what provided, I think in just listening to you and others, uh, the size of the demonstration, uh, how it transcended generations, um, what was really the energy that, that drove it to the, to the heights that it was able to achieve and still is achieving? I think the sense of crisis that people are losing their way of life. We took all this, the way of life, you know, the freedom we had for granted until it's really flattened and come so close to our heart, to our body, to our family. 
all of a sudden, we know that this is our straw. We, we don't stand in front of this line and fight for it. All we have will be lost forever. This is the last war. And this is very palpable in the way people were talking, in the way people are connecting, in the way people are interacting. So that's why this is the first time, actually, the older generation and the younger generation united into a resistance. Because the younger generation always accused us of not achieving anything. And we were not paid enough attention to the younger generation because they were not mobilized like they are today. And they haven't shown the kind of moral courage and discipline and the intellectual exercise they have displayed in this movement. Now, let's take the recent ray of the legislation council. Yes, they destroy something. But what they destroy is very small. And the means of destruction is used as a symbolic gesture to protest against the government. It's not an intention of destruction. They just paint some slogan on the wall, deface some of the photos of the past chairman, and they broke the grasses to, got, to, to get into the building. That's all they did. That's, you know, if they wanted, if they had an intention to, for destruction, they would have destroyed a lot of things. They keep all the artworks on the shelf, totally untouched, with a post, somebody put a post there, don't touch and destroy it. They took the drink from the refrigerator, the fridge, and they put down the money, and they even put some coins for the, for the other protesters who have no money, but have to use the electronic payment and leave their name there. So they were very disparate. They were very careful and very concerned about each other. You know, these are not you know, rioters. These are very disparate young men knowing what they are doing. Other questions? Right here in the front, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Lai. Thank it's, you. Uh, yeah, it's a great pleasure to have you here. Um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, after you met with the U.S. Secretary, oh, sorry, my name is Lee. I'm a reporter with Voice of America's Mandarin Service. After you met with U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, uh, Beijing has already expressed its displeasure, say, suggesting that the U.S. is interfering in its internal affairs, and also saying that supply. I mean, implying that you are trying to create chaos in Hong Kong. So I want to know if you have any reaction to that. Uh, secondly... First, first. Otherwise, I forget the first one. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I think it's an honor to be accused by the Chinese. Um, we never want to create riots. It is the government who wanted to take away our freedom. Our rule of law has forced us to react like this. You know, he, uh, they accused me of destroying the rule of law in Hong Kong. I haven't done this. You know, <laughs> I think what they, what they did is really destroying the rule of law in Hong Kong. So I don't care what they, what they say, and what they say really be an honor to me. OK. My second question uh, is, you made a very strong case for US expressing support uh, for Hong Kong. And you also mentioned uh, some specific actions that the United States can take, such as sending senators and congressmen to Hong Kong. I wonder what else uh, do you think 
the US and the international community can do to support Hong Kong, uh, other than the things you mentioned, other than just uh, words? I think it's very important that you know, the world will keep Hong Kong a first class city in the world. The more support we have from the outside world, the less our economy has to depend on China. The greater independency we feel, the greater force we can utilize to resist China. So the, the outside world support will give us the variable to persist in our fight. Morally and material, like making Hong Kong a free port again, give Hong Kong more preference in trade terms, in financing terms, and also maybe give Hong Kong the technology support that you don't give, you know, you, you don't give to China. Of course you do, you have to verify it. Because technology is very important to make Hong Kong a first class city in the future. We have to have we have to be the top class city to survive the persecution from China. The greater the resource that we have in the Hong Kong economy, the greater resource we can use for resistance. Other questions? Yes, ma'am, in the back. Oh, well, it's okay. You go first. It doesn't matter. Go ahead. Um, Ariel Bashi with CNN. I'm just curious if you think that President Xi fears uh, footage of a Tiananmen-like incident in Hong Kong going around the world, and that would stop him from doing something like that in Hong Kong. And my second question is... What, what's that? The first if, one. If he fears images circulating around the world of a similar incident like Tiananmen Square in Hong Kong. And my second question is, what do you make of the relationship in the way President Trump approaches President Xi and vice versa? Well, uh, the first question, I, I'm sure they, you know, they will be very careful to create a, a, a Tiananmen massacre in Hong Kong, but you also have to understand the recklessness of the Communist Party. Politics is first and foremost the most important. If they don't think that they cannot, if they don't think they can suppress the Hong Kong movement, they will be aware of the danger of Hong Kong's resistant movements becoming a beacon to the moral conscience of Chinese in China. If this happens, when the Chinese economy is plummeting, it will be very dangerous for the regime because the Communist Party's legitimacy of their rule on the people is their claim to improve people's economic welfare. I give you an example. Just recently, not even a year ago, a few of the real estate company, they sold part of their real estate at a higher price. After six months, they lowered the price, I forgot, about 15% or 17%. People went out to demonstrate. And the, the government intervened to make sure that this company compensate those who bought it more expensively. Because people in China, they have the conception of human rights very different from us because the Chinese regime's legitimacy is based on improving the economic welfare of the people. Economic welfare becomes the human right of the Chinese people. If the economy permit, at the same time, the message of Hong Kong or Taiwan's people's resistance is spreading to the Chinese in China. And all people need is five minutes to overcome their fear, and they will be in big trouble. So I, you know, I think that you know, the, 
the movement we make, we are actually move, uh, we are actually sending the moral force to the moral conscience of the Chinese people. That is what they are afraid of. If they are afraid of this, if they want to guard against this, they can use whatever measure they use, and that becomes Tiananmen Massacre. What's your next question? What did you make of the relationship between President Trump and President Xi and how they relate to each other? I think President Trump now knows, because President Trump as a businessman, as all the businessmen, they don't have the sensitivity for moral force as a politician or as a social activist. But I think President Trump is very smart. He knows that now the moral authority as a chip on the table in negotiating with China is powerful, is useful. I'm sure he will use that. I'm sure he will turn to that. He's a very smart businessman. This is a very strong and powerful weapon for him to use in negotiation. Hi, um, I'm from Radio Free Asia, but I'm not a reporter. Um, my question is that one of the things that we noticed very much in this last round of protests is the participation of people from the mainland. And I'm wondering if you have thoughts on um, how, what the impact is um, on the mainland. What is it that gave mainlanders the courage or the interest or the passion to participate in these protests? I mean, I thought that was a very significant um, change. Well, um, yes, there are some mainland participants. But more, what's more important we see a lot of newly immigrants. Once they have freedom and from high sight, they know how precious and valuable freedom is. And that's why having lived in Hong Kong for a short time, they, they also want to participate in this resistance. So I think that's what I just earlier talked about, the danger China is facing with Hong Kong people rising up and having the moral courage to fight the itinerary. If that information, which will definitely reach to the Chinese consciousness, will be very dangerous for them if there's a economic crisis to happen in China. Other questions? I have a question here in the front from Ambassador Wolfowitz. Jimmy, th thank you for being here. Thank you. And, th and thank you for the courage you have to be on the top 10 list of the PRC. <laughs> in fact, I think you've moved yourself up a little higher on the list. <laughs> it takes a lot of courage, and we admire that. I admire that. <clears throat> the Government in Beijing keeps saying that they represent 1.2 billion Chinese, but there's never been a vote to demonstrate that. If there exactly. were a vote, as you've said, yep. the people are too afraid to express their real opinion, mm -hmm. and they're kept ignorant of the real facts. So what is your feeling if China, how many of those 1.2 billion Chinese do you think really want to continue the sort of system that they have under the communists, and how many would prefer to live under Hong Kong government? And it's ironic that Hong Kong was established by a, as a colony of, of a colonial yeah. power. Well, I, I think the Chinese, as just, I said, you know, just said, before they know the freedom, they don't know how to treasure it. The inertia of living in an environment that you get used to the fear that is already inside your system, you just don't have the opening up to a new ideas, to a new struggle, 
to a new way of life. I mean, some crisis has to trigger it. Some crisis has to trigger it so the people will break out from their complacence or inertia. You know, that's why in North Korea, nobody, you know, those guys, everybody's like, like, a, like, a, like a very obedient lamb. You know, same in China. When you are being frightened into an inertia, you don't know that you're, 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 you're being frightened. You don't know that you're, you're any different from all the other people. Only in relative to what you know, what you have, from high sight, you know how precious freedom is. So I think that needs to be, you know, that, that needs to be some, some breakthrough, some trigger. And that's what I talk about that, you know, where if the economy is really permanent, coupled with the inference from the resistance of Hong Kong, and people realize the moral courage of Hong Kong people and overcome their fear. Only, it only takes 10 minutes, five minutes, for people to walk out. And the regime will be in big trouble. I don't mean that they will fall, but they will, make, they will be in big, big trouble. Yeah. What would you say, just to follow up on that, I mean, we hear a lot about how the standard of living in the mainland has gone up, that the yes. economy has skyrocketed, that yes. people are far more satisfied now than they ever have been. There, you, sure. I mean, you, that you can't compare uh, you know, mainland China to North Korea because, no. uh, right? No. I, so, uh, you know, I guess maybe talk about this sort of uh, the, the challenges that people face politically and, and how the economy plays into that. I think people definitely is, is much it's better off, you know, I think they're happier even. But everything is relative. And I think um, to a point people know that the in intangibles are more important than the tangibles. And that's why the new immigrants in Hong Kong, a lot of them joined this resistance movement just because they find out that hmm. there are intangibles, there are moral value, there are things that we never knew, but it's so precious to our life. I think that's the that's something that you know they will find out. Hmm. We have other questions from the audience. Uh, yes, sir. Jimmy Rupert Herman Chambers, U.S. Taiwan Business Council. Jimmy. Uh, President Tsai Ing-wen of Taiwan will be in the United States later this week. I wonder if you could touch a little bit on how you think what is happening in Hong Kong is impacting Taiwan at the moment. Um, as some of, or many of you may know here, Taiwan has a presidential election next January yep. the 11th, highly contested. I wonder if you could talk a wee bit about sure. how it's impacting. Well, um, the KMT, you know the KMT, Kuomintang, they have two of the most popular presidential candidates are China leaning, right? more than China leaning. They are all, you know, almost the puppets of, of the of, of the Chi you know, of, of the of the Chinese. When the first Resistance movement happened in Hong Kong, and the reporter asked them, "What is your view?" They said, "Oh, we don't know about this. We didn't notice about this." They tried to avoid it. Up until they see their poll drop, you know, precipitously. The officer alert, and two weeks later came out and support the Hong Kong movement for two things. First. They got to, you know, they got to get elected, so they they can do whatever they like. Second, the reason why they came out two weeks later, maybe they have to get the permission from China to do so. So, I think from this perspective, you see that Hong Kong's movement actually is impacting the politics in Taiwan, and there's a reason very in front of the presidential Paris in Taiwan, 
protesting about the red Indian, uh, the red media, because a lot of, or I would say most actually, the media in Taiwan are owned by tycoon, tycoons who have big business in China. All those tycoons use the acquisition of the media to turn it into Chinese leaning as a political PR to do business in China. So this really outrage the Taiwanese people after they seen the resistance movement in Hong Kong. I think there will be another campaign like this, another, you know, very soon closing, you know, we're approaching to the, to the final stage of the election. As a media guy, I noticed that the Taiwanese were not so interested in what happened to Hong Kong. For so instance, we had we had demonstrations, we had rallies during June 4th anniversary, almost nobody care in Taiwan. But this time, during this movement, our paper carry three or four front pages in the newspaper and the readership, the online, the online readership is phenomenal. People in Taiwan, they wrote songs, they rally, they sing the song in the street in support of Hong Kong's movement. They have group of young people came to Hong Kong to join the, the movement. The solidarity now is built between these two places. It's a moral solidarity that makes Hong Kong and Taiwan a nightmare for the Chinese. Because whatever they hurt Hong Kong, Taiwan reacts. And why see versa? That makes it very complicated for Chinese to handle these two places. Mm. And this will reinforce Hong Kong and Taiwan, each other's moral courage in fighting the war because we are fighting the same enemy. We are under the same persecution. That same that sameness has united us into a solidarity. And this is going to be more and more solid when time comes. And this will be a big nightmare for the Chinese regime. You know, it's interesting. When we were in Taiwan just a few weeks ago, we were hearing a lot about Xi Jinping's statement about uh, the year 2020. Uh, being a fateful one for relations between uh, China and Taiwan. So something that was on the minds of many of the officials that we spoke to. And I think this also contributed to their uh, sense of uh, urgency in what was happening in, in Hong Kong, that they wanted to see things go the right way, that perhaps it would um, uh, keep uh, Beijing occupied in lots of different places. Mm -hmm. Um, and not to be able to turn their attention to Taiwan yeah. as well. Yeah. Well, um, I think the movement in Hong Kong is a reminder or constant movement will be a constant reminder to the world that China is not to be trusted. That, I just heard that a lot of money now, the lobbying money in Washington from China, that is a PR hole no matter how much money you have, you cannot feel. Money is not everything. Moral force is everything now in this Cold War with China. This is a recognition. 
the American people have to recognize. It is your foreign authority that will win over China. It is your moral authority that in 20 years, the world will embed in your values and not dominate by the biggest economy, the greater monster we have to face that dominate Asia and the world with their values. If we look at the 20 years down and ask ourselves whether we want our children to live in a world like this, it's time for us now to act to show our moral force in fighting this Cold War. Well, unfortunately, we've run out of time here. Uh, but I want to, first of all, thank you, thank you. for uh, joining us today for a terrific conversation. Thank you. I want to wish you success in your meetings here in Washington with uh, senior senators and others. And um, we hope you'll come back and visit us and share stories of your success looking back thank you. on this movement in, in <laughs> Hong Kong. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming, everybody.